Sunday, March 6th. Uh, this meeting of the Minnesota Senate Agricultural Broadband and Rural Development Committee is now in session. Uh, today, folks, we've got lots of fun stuff to talk about. We're going to very quickly go back over our conversation about grain indemnity that we uh, began last week. We should take care of that with uh, some efficiency uh, so that we can move on to some other bills that we need to discuss today. The first, which will be Senate File 1727 with Senator Gustafson about the Good Acre. Then Senator Gustafson will talk to us a little bit about urban agricultural grants appropriations. And then another Senator Gustafson to talk to us about farm to school program establishment. Then uh, Senator Kunish will talk to us about pollinator research funding. And last, Senator Kunish will tell us a little bit about University of Minnesota Heritage Oil Seed and Grain Initiative Appropriation. So our first order of business, uh, Senator Kupek, Senate File 2218, please. So, Senator Kopech, did Senate file 2218 as amended. Senator Kubek, if you could just sort of refresh our memory real quick. Give us a minute or two about what we're talking about. Sure. We are talking about uh, Senate File 2218. Uh, it is the grain indemnity bill. Uh, so what we're asking for is we're going to be like $15 million uh, to start a grain indemnity fund. Uh, we've seen uh, a number of elevators over the last few years that have gone under and have left uh, some farmers basically uh, on the hook uh, without getting paid. And this will basically form uh, a type of insurance to ensure that if that were to happen, uh, that they would have some coverage. And again, uh, if we fully fund it at the $15 million, there is actually nothing will change uh, going in and out. And then the fund, uh, when it drops below $9 million, uh, then there would be a, a fee tacked on to grain sales uh, to refund the fund, and then there is an opt out uh, if you would like to do that. If people did not want to be participate, uh, they could mail in and they could get that money refunded to them. So that is where uh, the basic gist of the Senate file is. Thank you very much, Senator Kupak, for that efficient uh, description. Now, members recall we discussed this at length last week. Uh, we did say it was a work in progress, and we opted to take the weekend to think about it a little bit more in case there were any um, amendments we initially wanted to place in. But I do also want to acknowledge that this is still a work in progress, and today is just the first couple steps in that direction. So with that being said, I understand there are some amendments to be offered. And actually, before I say that, I need to acknowledge that we do have a quorum today. So, uh, Member Senator Westrom. Chair, um, oh, I, I'm sorry, Senator Westrom. Uh, Senator Kupek has a, an amendment for Senator Kupek's A5 amendment. Sure, I have the A5 amendment, and what that does is, as we had talked about uh, last week, uh, we wanted to clarify uh, a little bit that the seller-to-seller -seller transaction uh, would not be part of that fee, and so uh, it was flagged that that language in some places wasn't exactly clear, so it clarifies that language when there was also a date that was incorrect on the bill, and so the A5 also corrects that date. Uh, thank you, Senator Kubek. Members, we had a chance to see that. That was sent out with some of our materials earlier today, so I'm going to go uh, as efficiently as we can to it. Any, any moments of questions or comments? Members, to the A5 amendment, all in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? <laughs> Passes, and uh, the bill is amended. The A5 amendment is accepted. Uh, further amendments, uh, Senator Westrom. Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'd um, move the A3 amendment. Uh, Senator Messer moves the A3 amendment. Mr. Chair, um, this, uh, uh, this amendment would just deal with, uh, actually, uh, Ms. Painter, I want to make sure I've got the number right. A3 is the financial one, right, the reporting. Um, Mr. Chair, uh, one, of the, one of the things I talked about last week, and uh, uh, as we move, move this along and continue to work on it, I've had a chance to talk to uh, uh, Commissioner Peterson and others at the MDA and other interest uh, groups, agriculture uh, interest groups, and just um, as the 
initial author of uh, some of the changes in 2019 that were made that did add uh, cost and more reporting uh, to elevators and especially small smaller uh, providers. Uh, there were financial reports and CPA audits and reviews that, uh, and as well as other more expensive audits that were put in place in lieu of a grain indemnity fund in 2019. And uh, as we're continuing to discuss this, uh, I would uh, suggest we should uh, go back and take those provisions out if we're going to go down the path of the Grain Indemnity Fund, uh, which was elected not to uh, have gone down in 2019. Uh, now, Mr. Chair, since uh, with, with the weekend and since uh, developing this language, I realize there's some that think there's some uh, work that we could still do. Uh, the current bird, uh, requirements of uh, financial reporting and audits is expensive. It's hard to find CPAs. It is burdensome. And... Uh, and so, but they, they do think there's maybe a mid-level or a, um, a base level that we should find uh, of, of some reporting or some uh, rep uh, financial information that should be submitted. And so, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, I would ask the committee to um, adopt this amendment today, but I say that recognizing and, and open to uh, some modifications uh, from the department and other uh, interest groups that I uh, want to make sure we have secure, solid, financially uh, stable uh, elevators, but uh, Mr. Chair, recognizing many of them are small businesses, all of them are private businesses, and uh, uh, there's only so much paperwork that, uh, that is reasonable, and uh, there, uh, we don't want to, uh, we want to find that happy medium. And so, uh, Mr. Chair, this would just repeal and re put us back a uh, condition on the fact that the ingrained indemnity fund would pass, uh, then we would, we would take away these other re reporting requirements uh, in lieu of going down this path instead uh, with the idea that there may be some tweaks over the next few weeks uh, as this bill is being worked on. And uh, Mr. Chair, maybe in concluding in my comments, it would be helpful. You and I had had a discussion about uh, uh, kind of the pathway of this bill uh, so members know and Maybe they all know as well, but uh, this does have to go to some other committee stops. I think uh, there's some concerns that some of us have that we want to continue to keep working on. And so uh, my understanding of the path of this bill would be uh, moving to other committees, but ultimately would be coming back here through, a, through an omnibus bill, uh, likely uh, in a finance omnibus bill as part of a, um, a budget bill that we pass out of this committee. Is that, am I accurate in restating that? Yes, thank you, Senator Restrom. Yes, that, that is accurate. We will continue to work on this, and there are, there are weeks of tweaks coming forward, and we will work on those together. I will commit to that. Uh, so uh, I suppose, uh, Senator Kupek, uh, would you like to respond to the A3 amendment? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator uh, Westrom. It has been uh, my understanding, too, and I've discussed this with the department, um, that they, too, uh, would like to see, as Senator Westrom said, some sort of floor and base, but that, that they are okay with this amendment now and having the bill continue to move forward. So, Mr. Chair and Senator Westrom, I would accept this as a friendly amendment to the bill. So, members, uh, Senator Kupek supports the amendment, as do I, and Senator Westrom. So, just very quickly, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The A4 amendment is... A three amendment is adopted. Mr. Chair. Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, I'd move the A4 amendment. Senator Westrom moves the A4 amendment. And, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, the A4 amendment uh, is language that deals with uh, voluntary uh, opt-out or the opt-out options for uh, farmers. Um, I'm, I still think we need to improve some of the opt-out language, uh, making it more voluntary up front. But whatever we come up with in the end, I think education and information for those uh, affected is uh, very important and good practice. And so uh, what this amendment does is just says that the MDA uh, needs to come up with a flyer as well as a poster for elevators to post in conspicuous place in their office for, for, for their patrons or customers, farmers, to be able to see on the poster board perhaps, but also flyers with information on how they would opt out if they so choose to not want to have the indemnity fund coverage. 
And then thirdly, the department also comes up with this information and, and makes it available on their website. Uh, so farmers, consumers have that information uh, readily available to them if uh, they uh, want to opt out or know how to, to do that and get the information uh, easily. And so this would make it available. But again, MDA would have to take this, uh, uh, take on the obligation of getting the posters ready so the elevators don't have to. Uh, they just would have to post it in a conspicuous spot in their, their office. So something I hope we can continue to work on, but I think it just makes the process better and, and more informed for everybody involved. I think this is a great idea, Senator Westrom. So uh, Senator Kupek, to the A4 amendment, what do you got? Mr. Chair and Senator Westrom, I believe uh, fully in transparency. Uh, and so I think notifying people of, of the changes that have been made and, and what their options are, uh, I think that is absolutely fine. So I would look at this amendment also as a friendly amendment. Thank you, Senator Kupak. So to the A4 amendment, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? The A4 amendment is adopted. Um, any further amendments, members? Seeing none. Uh, any further discussion of the bill itself as amended? Senator Dames. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I think that this bill uh, with the amendments comes a long way, but I think there's still an awful lot of work to do in this bill. And I think it's unfortunate that the Ag Committee is passing off a bill like this and moving it forward. What we should be doing is sending the parties out and having an agreement made, bring the bill back, and then pass it out. But we're choosing just to move it forward in a flawed position, and that's okay, but uh, I think there's a lot of work to do in this bill, and therefore I'm not going to be able to support it until it gets straightened out. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Dames. Members, any further comments or discussions? Senator Western? Mr. S Mr. Chair, uh, just, just a few additional comments. Um, Senator Kupik uh, talked about the, the voluntary portion of this bill, and uh, I did talk, uh, as I said, uh, with Commissioner Peterson uh, last Friday, MDA staff, and um, I, I still think we can do a better job of coming up with a, a voluntary or an easier way for farmers, consumers to get um, to opt out if they so choose. Um, uh, the example I keep hearing over and over from farmers and uh, some of them that sell to uh, an elevator that's uh, in most people's mind view viewed as uh, financially uh, solid, uh, uh, CHS is a fairly common one out in our area, and uh, those farmers feel that they, they, they can take their risk and keep their indemnity fund uh, in their pockets if, um, if they so choose. And, and maybe they're right, maybe they're wrong. I mean, that's a little bit of the unknown we all have uh, in life, but it's also the freedom of choice and the freedom of keeping their money. And, uh, Mr. Chair, I've been doing just some back of the napkins calculating, uh, Senator Kupik, and uh, on 1,000 acres of corn at 200 bushels, um, average an acre, would uh, be about 200,000 bushels, and uh, my calculations is this fee would be about $2,000 for, for that farmer uh, raising 1,000 acres. And so um, the concern is a system that people have to submit their money uh, have it taken out of their check, they don't get to use it for whatever their expenses are or for their profit or cost of living, a family's living, and they have to then wait for 90 days, uh, up to 90 days to get it back after they've done the paperwork of turning it in. And uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Kupik, uh, I just think that's not a proper burden to put on every farmer across the state of Minnesota. Um, so I still would like us to try to find a way to get a more voluntary system that really is voluntary uh, from the front end where somebody can just opt out and not have that money taken out of their check, but then they're also not going to be uh, receiving the insurance. Uh, um, you know, I've talked to some and many of us know the Menards has this 11% rebate that they uh, advertise as a sale and uh, it's, you know, it's attractive to get people in the store. You know, I was talking to some folks uh, that that were kind of in the know and work work there. And uh, one of the things that they talked about, we just were casually visiting, but they and, it, and it's pretty logical. You know, not everybody sends in the rebate, and that's how they can advertise 11% uh, off. And really, they're probably only paying 
they're giving a five or six or seven percent off because of all the people that they count on that will not send in for that rebate. And uh, it's just extra paperwork. It's uh, people's lives are busy. And so I just raise this concern as we continue to work on it. Uh, hopefully, I know the commissioners committed that uh, they would continue to keep looking at this as well as uh, other areas to improve. And so, uh, Mr. Chair, I just raised that as a, a, a concern. I know there's some other concerns about uh, is 36 months uh, longer than we really uh, need to uh, set the program up and be obligated to uh, to uh, reimburse. Uh, if we had 12 months or 18 months, uh, we wouldn't need as much collected off the uh, bush, uh, bushel of grain to replenish the fund because the fund wouldn't be as exposed as if um, it is under three years of, uh, of uh, coverage. Um, at some point, uh, there's a lot more speculation going on and not collecting your, your check from, from the elevator uh, than if you've just brought it in and, and the elevator pays it out within a year or the fund would cover you for a year. And so I think there's some areas like that that we need to continue looking at. Uh, Senator Kupik, I know you've said you're open to, to continuing to work on this, but Mr. Chair, I just wanted to take this opportunity to highlight a few of the things. I know there's some uh, issues that we need to want and want to continue to work on uh, to make uh, improve this bill uh, as, as it would go forward if, if, if we were to come to implementation. And so uh, I know some of the ag groups are very uh, concerned about a voluntary system that would be much more user friendly. And um, I hope we can continue to work on that. But Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Kupik uh, just wanted to raise those and I know we've talked about them privately as well. So I appreciate your uh, indulgence and appreciate you uh, continuing to be open to, to working on improving this uh, to ultimately make it work well for uh, those affected and those that want to be a part of it uh, if, if it gets passed. Thank you, Senator Wester. Members, any other comments? Uh, I just want to say uh, that I'm uh, incredibly grateful that we're doing this. When I first got this gavel months and months ago, one of the very first things I heard from farmers was the need for a grain indemnity bill. Members, we have a responsibility to listen to advocates, but we also have a responsibility to listen to the voice of farmers themselves. We heard it last week very clearly, but we would have been hearing it had we been listening for the last four months too. Farmers want this. They want it badly. Our responsibility is to make it into something that is functional and that works for and with them. And that's something that we have been doing and that we will continue to do. We have been working to improve this bill for the past months. Farmers have been at the table talking with us about what they need in a bill like this, as have their advocates. I am committed to continuing that work in that same spirit with those same stakeholders as we continue to refine this thing that the farmers have asked us for. Now, Senator Kupik, any closing statements? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Senator Westrom. I would agree there are, uh, there might be a couple of other areas that we could tighten things up, and I know um, if there is a way that we could do that kind of opt-in, uh, that's a possibility, but I have heard from the, well, we also heard from the elevators last week that that was difficult for them. Uh, we did also hear from the department, and I also have, I got an email this afternoon from the Secretary of State who said that this would be a, a it would be pretty costly on their end in terms of software and updates um, on their side to, to do that as well. But if we could find a way, uh, I'm certainly open to it, and I'm certainly also open to the, the looking at the 36 months of reducing that. I think that is that is a worthy goal to also try to achieve. So, so with that, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, I would move that uh, Senate File 2218 as amended uh, be recommended to pass and refer to the Committee on State and Local Government and Veterans, and I'm gonna ask for roll call. Senator Kupek moves that Senate File 2218 as amended um, be recommended to pass and move to the Committee on State, Local Government, and Veterans. Roll call has been requested. Roll call will be granted. Chair Putnam? Yes. Vice Chair Kupek? Yes. Lead Westrom? No. Senator Anderson? No. Senator Dames? No. Senator Dornick? Yes. Senator Gustafson? Yes. Senator Kunish? Yes. Senator Seberger? Yes.
With a vote of six yeas and three nays, Senate File 2218, as amended, has passed and will be referred to the Committee on State, Local Government, and Veterans. Thank you, Senator Kupak. All right, folks, up next is Senate File 1727, Senator Gustafson, the Good Acre Grant Appropriation for the Local Emergency Assistance Farmer Fund Program. Senator Gustafson, if you would please uh, introduce us to your bill. Senator Gustafson, in the interest of efficiency, I'm going to ask some of your testifiers to come up to the table as well, if we could, please. Would Mr. Van Eekhout and Ms. Winsberger please come to the table and have a seat? And Senator Gustafson, if you would introduce your bill when you're ready. Mr. Senator Gustafson, I understand you have an amendment. I do, yes. Can you give me the, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, can you give me the Senate file number again? 1727. I have three, so I want to make sure. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Gustin. Senator Gustafson, your um, author's amendment? Uh, yes, I believe that the committee has it. I'd like to move that it be considered so we can get the bill in the order that is fit. Senator Gustafson moves the A1 amendment. Senator Gustafson, do you have it in front of you? Would you mind describing it for us real quick? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, the Good Acre is the largest nonprofit food hub in Minnesota. They play a crucial role in creating market access for farmers in our region. Um, 2022 was the most impactful year yet, with $1.7 million of local food purchased from over 120 local farmers and makers through our food hub. With one-on-one -on -one grower support services to local produce, produce farmers, connections to wholesale markets that pay an equitable price to farmers, and affordable share-use kitchen rental, they realize that the mission to connect and strengthen farmers, food makers, and communities is through good food. Um, with your permission, Mr. Chair, in the order you see fit, I'm ready to hand it over to the testifiers. Uh, uh Senator Gustafson, first we'd like to just take care of the amendment real quickly if we could. Um, could you describe uh, the content of the amendment for us real quick? Um, yes, so the, the amendment for 1727 is just to match the language that the House used to expedite and sort of streamline the two bills so that they're in the proper order. Thank you, Senator Gustafson. So to, uh, any discussion of the A1 amendment members? Mr. Chair, Senator Dames. some of us don't have that amendment, could, so could the Senator uh, go through the differences in what the House had and what we had, what we're changing? Sir Names, you don't have the A1 amendment in front of you, or you don't have the... I have a copy okay. Discussion of the A1 amendment. Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The A1 amendment is adopted. Senator Gustafson to the Senate file 1727 as adopted, as amended, excuse me. Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, when you're ready, the testifiers are ready to begin. Certainly, Mr. Van Eekout, if you could please state your full name for the record and commence your testimony when you're ready. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is David Van Eckow. I'm the Farm Program Director at the Good Acre, a nonprofit food hub based in Falcon Heights, Minnesota. Before coming to the Good Acre, my wife and I operated our own organic vegetable farm, serving the Twin Cities for over 15 years. In my current role, I am able to bring a farmer's perspective into much of our work at the Good Acre. I'm here today on behalf of our organization and the many farmers we work with to express support for Senate File 1727, a grant to the Good Acre for the Local Emergency Assistance Farmer Fund, also known as LEAF. LEAF began in 2020 as a multi-organizational collaboration to support emerging vegetable farmers due to the loss of their markets caused by the pandemic. Many farmers were able to pivot to online sales and other new opportunities, but for farmers with language barriers, technology challenges, or lack of emergency funds, there was a need for a program that would support these farmers through a challenging year. At the same time, hungry families were lining up all over the state to get access to food as employees were laid off and schools were closed. In conjunction with our partners, we developed the LEAF program, where farmers accepted into the program are guaranteed a fixed amount of market rate sales. The produce is then donated to multiple hunger relief organizations, as well as directly to consumers through community school-based distribution sites. What has made LEAF such a successful program is that it was designed by farmers for farmers. Our program partners and I brought the farmer perspective to the development of the program, emphasizing the needs of farmers in order to make the program a success. Meeting the farmers where they were at was our constant goal. In the last three years, LEAF has purchased over $784,000 worth of produce from 88 participating farmers. Those purchases have resulted in over 435,000 pounds of number one quality fresh produce being donated to hunger relief organizations for distribution to more than 80 sites throughout Minnesota. In addition, farmers who began working with us because of the LEAF program have gone on to sell the Good Acres other wholesale customers almost $2 million in produce over the last three years, providing a stable and consistent market opportunity that builds economic mobility. LEAF has turned out to be much more than an emergency pivot during the pandemic. It has become a powerful program that has had a major impact. LEAF provides a new market opportunity for farmers, a source of fresh, culturally relevant produce for communities in need, LEAF teaches farmers new skills for selling to wholesale markets. It reduces food waste on farms, helps farmers manage risk, and has become a model for other communities to develop similar programs. <clears throat> Excuse me. We are honored and grateful that the LEAF program was included in the supplemental budget last year and the support of the Senate was very much appreciated. We're, we're honored again to be included in the governor's budget recommendations. State officials have spoken on multiple occasions of the importance of the LEAF program and urged its expansion. Each year, demand outweighs the available funding for the program. In this bill, we are requesting $400,000 in annual funding, with up to 25% of that amount allocated annually to cover our direct farmer technical assistance and training, logistical support, and development of pilot programs in greater Minnesota. We are also requesting $100,000 in fiscal 24 for pilot program purchases. Since its beginning, LEAF has maintained its focus on farmers by listening to our farm partners. This farmer engagement has shaped the program to provide more flexible delivery times, introduce new culturally relevant crops, and to adjust pricing to better meet market conditions. 100% of the farmers who participate in LEAF want the program to continue. And speaking as a farmer myself, I know that getting 100% of farmers to agree on anything is an accomplishment of its own. LEAF isn't an idea, it is a real program that is working right now to help emerging farmers. Please help us continue this important work by supporting Senate File 1727. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vanicott. Uh, Ms. Winsberger, if you would please state your full name for the record and commence your testimony when you're ready. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I'm so happy to meet you again. I was here last time. My name, my name's, for the record, is Jane Winsberger. I'm a farmer from uh, Ogrovi, um, just acquired this uh, piece of property on, in 2021. Um, previously, I, I worked as a nurse, and I worked like 20 plus years, um, and I changed my ways of work so, to farming. So right now, I'm a farmer um, uh, where I grow naturally organic vegetables. Um, I'm here today. Mr. Sa, on behalf of myself 
and many farmers who grow food for the local emergency in, uh, assistance farming fund program, also known as LEAF. <coughs> this program, as David has just read, was uh, granted to help small farmers um, during the COVID-19 pandemic, and it was deeply impactful for me and my community. Although the pandemic has tapered off, the issues of food insecurity and market access did not. So I'm currently a member of the Emerging Farmers Working Group through the Department of uh, Agriculture. Um, my own uh, uh, farmers working group through the Department of Agriculture, I'm sorry. Not only do we identify the barriers uh, emerging farmers face, but we also uh, advise the department on ways to improve equity and access for farmers like me. Some of the identified barriers I face alongside my community are access to markets and negoti negotiate prices for the produce we plant in our gardens. The LEAVE program doesn't just help farmers like me uh, secure market, but it provides food for families that are most in need. Leave is not, does not require membership, that you have to be a member like any other food groups, which you have to be a member in order for you to sell to them. So they accept you the way you come to them. So I cannot stress in, uh, enough that there is no shortage of farmers like me who have the knowledge and ability to grow food. We want to find our, our markets, and the LEAVE program has helped us to do that. I ask you, your support in finding the, uh, funding the Good Acre LEAVE program. Funding LEAVE means a lot to us underdeserved communities, as we do not get through other markets as the example I just gave you. Um, on behalf of the farmers who might be a little nervous to come to this session, I want to thank you so much for considering us, even going ahead to talk about emerging farmers in the great state of Minnesota, and giving us an opportunity, somebody like me, to come and you, to talk to you and you are listening to me. So I just want to thank you so much for this opportunity. What I'm, I'm just requesting from... Um, you, my senators, is instead of us coming to beg you for funding to the places, markets like this one, you can just pass this and then let it continue so we are assured that we have a market where we can take our, our, our food. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Winsberg, and it's good to see you again. Uh, Mr. Lohr. Robert Lohr. Mr. Lohr, if you would please come to the table and um, uh, state your full name for the record and commence your testimony. Yes. <clears throat> Dear Mr. Chairman and member of the committee, my name is Robert Lohr. I have come from Laos for 43 years. So I have been farming on Maori on St. Croix Township on Bee River Farm for 15 years. So I just would like to ask him for the chairman and member to support for the LEAP program for farmers to grow more vegetable or more produce to the local, uh, fresh vegetable to the local community service to people. Thank you, Mr. Thank Lohr. you. <laughs> Thank you. Members, questions for the author or uh, any of our testifiers? Senator Westrom. Um, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Gustafson, uh, I see you looking through the bill. Uh, it's allowing uh, $100,000 a year out of the $400,000 uh, just for administrative costs. Uh, can you explain that? That seems like a, a lot of money going to just an administrative cost uh, for, for grants that are supposed to be going out. Um, so if you could explain that, it, uh, it just that's it's much higher than, than we often see. Senator Gustafson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator Westrom. I'm gonna actually have our testifier answer that question, if that's all right with you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Van Eekhout. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> 
Thank you, Senator Westrom. So that's the reason for the A1 amendment is that language was mischaracterized when this bill initially was drawn up by saying that it's for administration. We, re we offer complete services to farmers through our support network, which is why there is an amendment um, using different language. The 25% represents the comprehensive support services that we supply, logistics support of receiving distribution and delivery, and the development of the pilot programs in greater Minnesota. So the farmer support we provide includes on-farm technical assistance, training, and support for land access and funding opportunities. It's very similar to the work of the University Extension, and I don't think anyone would consider that the work of University Extension is 100% administrative, so it's really just we needed an amendment to better represent the work that that 25%, that $100,000 represents. Thank you, Ms. Finnegan. Okay. Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, um, uh, so, so what percentage is going to administration after we, with the new language in the amendment? Mr. Van Eken. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Westrom, I don't know that number off the top of my head. I would say it's in the 6 to 7 percent range. Ms. Senator Westrom. That's it for now, Mr. Chair. Senator Dames. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I may not get your name right here, but Mr. Van Eckhout, I believe I'm close. Uh, can you tell me, I think in your testimony you said that there was about $748,000 worth of food. Is that correct? From 88 farmers? Ms. Van Eco. Mr. Chair, Senator, over the last three years of the program, the program began in 2020, and so for the 2020 season, 21 and 22, the total amount of purchasing from farmers was $784,000. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Follow-up? Senator Dames. So can you tell me what the total production was or what percent of the production you're purchasing? Mr. Venico. Mr. Chair, Senator, I do not know what the total percent of our farmers' output is we're purchasing through this program. Most of our farmers do operate both at farmer's market or even additional wholesale sales to either the Good Acre or other customers. So it's... Generally, because the number has been over the years between $5,000 and $7,000 of purchasing per individual farm, that it represents a fairly, you know, small amount of the farmer's overall output. I would say less than 20%. Follow-up, Mr. Chair? Senator Dames. So the purpose of this program is the purpose of the program to purchase the excess produce that's grown or to be the major major purchaser of the produce growing. Mr. Benico. Mr. Chair, Senator, um, the, the purpose of the program is to, <clears throat> excuse me, um, to provide training to farmers to understand how to access wholesale markets and also be able to purchase excess produce that's coming from farmers. That's why farmers, 98% of the farmers have told us that this program helps them to reduce food waste on their farms. So it, it has never been the intention of the program to be the majority of sales for any given farmer. Follow up, Mr. Chair? Senator Dames. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And can you tell me, with, uh, with the technical assistance that you're providing and the training you're providing for these farmers, is part of that helping them develop new markets? Mr. Benico. Mr. Chair, thank you, Senator. Um, yes, that is, that is correct. They are able to access new markets through this technical assistance and training, whether that's, that's growing crops that they may not have grown before because their farmer's market customers aren't requesting them, and then they find out there's a market for it and they seize that opportunity, or it's working with other wholesale buyers that we're acquainted with and can help them get a contract for the year. So about 40 of these farms have a contract with us for other wholesale sales this year to other customers. So they are, through that training, able to understand what it means to sell to wholesale, how to do everything from the labeling to the invoicing to accounts receivable to packaging and all of that. And that definitely makes it so they can access the, those other markets. That's why of the uh, 88 farmers, we've had almost $2 million in sales that they've been able to make to other markets. Senator Dames. Follow-up, Mr. Chair. Senator Dames. Can you tell me 
there's some talk about a pilot program in Greater Minnesota. Can you explain a little bit what that's going to involve and what you want to, what information you're seeking to find? Mr. Vanica. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator. We uh, have been contacted by a number of organizations over the three years that we've been running the LEAF program that have heard about it and are interested and want to know how they could start something like that in their communities. So more pointedly, in the last six months or so, we've been talking to the Bemidji Community Food Shelf in Beltrami County and the Rice County, I think it's the Faribault, I don't know the name of their food shelf exactly, but I believe it's in Faribault. They have both expressed an interest in starting a program at their locations, and we reached out to them to say, this may be an opportunity that we could seek some funding to be able to help start these programs with you and offer you our resources that we've developed to do this program while they use it to develop a program that meets the needs of their communities to look out how, how they want to access which types of farmers that they want to work with in their communities and crops and the capacity of their own food shelves to uh, store produce, which can be a challenge for some food shelves. So I think it's really that we want to support them with the infrastructure and our understanding of the program, but let them develop a program that meets the needs of their community. Follow up, Mr. Chair. Senator Dames. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This will be my last question. Are you working with the extension programs in the communities you're already working in, and will you be working with them in greater Minnesota? Mr. Van Eco. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator. Uh, we do work routinely with Extension, especially the, you know, as you may well know, um, Extension only has two statewide fruit and vegetable um, extension agents. So we work fairly closely with them because they're the statewide agents. Um, we would be more than happy to work with local agents in those communities when we start to develop a program. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, any further questions for the author or her testifiers? Senator Anderson. Thank you, <clears throat> Mr. Chair. Um, the Commissioner of Agriculture is uh, going to be appropriating grants. What are the, what's the average size of a grant that's given out? You said you had 88 farmers that were a part of this program in the past years. Uh, what do you predict, predict for grants, and what are the size of those grants that are given out? Mr. Van Eco. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Anderson. We, uh, it has depended on the funding level we've had each successive year. So we like to make a meaningful uh, grant to farmers. It has ranged anywhere from, I think the lowest amount we had was in 2021. We had $4,500 per farm was the total of each farm's granted funds. And uh, the most we've had was in 2020 where we had $7,500 available to each farm. Follow up. Senator Anderson. Thank you. Uh, and also, the uh, that those grants were for the Good Acre, for the local emergency assistance farmer fund. Uh, how about the grants for the the uh, pilot programs that are being uh, asked for in, in this uh, legislation? Uh, what what size are those grants? And is there a report that has to be filed by the individual producer after? the season is over with so that you know or we would know uh, what has transpired on the, from these grants? Mr. Van Eco. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Anderson, we, um, we keep very detailed records of what each farmer brings in on each delivery. So when they are granted that $5,000, uh, which was our number last year, we track those numbers each time they deliver so that we know that what they're, how much they have left to utilize. And so we have that data and that's the data we had funding from MDA last year. And so that's the data we would share with Ashley Bress who works with uh, the Department of Agriculture in order to um, get our reimbursement for those funds. So we have complete reporting data on what every farmer brings and when they bring it. Uh, in answer to your other question, the development of the pilot programs, the $100,000 would be used directly for purchasing. So we would work with those, <clears throat> excuse me, outside organizations to determine what they felt like the capacity was for their individual food shelf and what sort, how large of a program they wanted to do. So if they had a lot of need in their community, we would listen to that. So potentially we just have two letters of support from organizations right now that could 
potentially grow to a larger number that we would work with to access those funds. Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and how many are you projecting for new pilot programs coming up in this next growing season? And maybe you've got it further out than that, just that, but for the next season for sure. Mr. Van Eken. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Anderson, we uh, are projecting for sure to have two and perhaps three or four. Because it is a pilot, we don't want to get too ahead of ourselves and make sure that we do it right so that it's really supporting the needs of the communities. Members, any further questions or comments? Senator Dames. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Could you tell me, sir, the 88 farmers, what the average size of those farms would be? Mr. Van Eco. Mr. Chair, uh, thank you, Senator Dames. The, um, in acreage or gross sales? Acreage. Acreages are fairly small. As, as you may know, that uh, fruits and vegetables or other specialty crops have a high dollar value per acre, sometimes up to twenty or $30,000 per acre in gross sales. So most of these farms are in the five to 10 acre range. Thank you. Members, any further uh, questions or comments? Senator Gustafson, your closing comments. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A couple of things. Uh, the pilot program is part of the Greater Minnesota Expansion Plan. And then, as, as my testifier uh, said, Rice County, Bemidji, and also Little Falls. And I think I, I mentioned that because we have to remember that independent farmers are also small business owners. These are people who are interested in agriculture. And in order for us to expand our reach, and I think in this committee too, we can all identify that any time that we can get new people into agriculture industry, it's a good thing. And if we can support them along the way, even better so that we set them up for success and welcome them into our agricultural community. So um, I urge uh, support on this and I thank you for your time. Thank you, Senator Gustafson. Senate file 1727 as amended will be laid over for possible inclusion. Next up on the menu, Senator Gustafson, Senate file 2016, Urban Agriculture and Grants Appropriation. Um, Senator Gustafson, I'm going to ask your uh, testifiers to come to the table, if we could, please, to uh, make the process as efficient as possible. Ms. Horowitz and Mr. Page, if you would please come up to the table and have a seat. And Senator Gustafson, if you would introduce the bill when you're ready. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair, fellow committee members. Um, this is a Senate file 2016. Uh, the bill is straightforward but necessary investment in urban agriculture youth education and urban agricultural development grants. It appropriates 1.5 million in fiscal years 24 and 25 to the MDA's Agri program to provide grants in those two years. The bill helps empower urban communities to take charge of pressing food insecurity and nutritional deficiencies while also adding much needed green spaces which revitalize a community far better than a new concrete building ever can. Urban agriculture adds new energy to communities desperately in need of places to connect and feel inspired, and I'm extremely proud to offer this bill in support. Um, since this bill has dropped, many have asked why invest in urban agriculture when traditional rural agriculture has so many needs of its own. But it is a misservice to pit the two against each other. Not only does urban agriculture address the often anemic and unhealthy food systems that hurt many urban Minnesotans, it fosters a connection to and appreciation for agriculture that many of our urban citizens have never had an opportunity to develop. In doing so, it builds a bridge between inner city and rural Minnesota, giving many Minnesotans a taste of the wonderful things farming has to offer, and hopefully fostering a new generation looking to return our shrinking rural communities. At a time when growing divide between urban and rural has clearly become unhealthy for Minnesota, I believe it's important that we work to build more bridges. I believe Senate File 2016 does exactly that while also addressing urban food system issues, and I urge you to support it. Thank you, Senator Gustafson. Ms. Horowitz, if you would please sit your full name for the record and commence your testimony when you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Vice Chair. My name is Michelle Horowitz. Um, H-O-R-O-V-I-T-Z. Um, thank you, Senator Gustafson, for introducing this bill, and thank you all for your time. Um, I will be brief. I am one of the co-founders and um, work at Appetite for Change. We're a nonprofit uh, social enterprise organization in North Minneapolis. Our mission is to use food as a tool to build health, wealth, and social change. And we were one of the small players in a very large group of people, many of whom are here today, um, who years ago came to the state 
uh, House and Senate and said, let's, let's try to talk about urban agriculture. And, and a lot of folks were like, what? What is that? Well, let's study it first. And the House did do a study. And they found out, well, this is actually a thing. And, and, and you all invested in it. And you have been investing in it. So thank you. Um, thank you to Commissioner um, Peterson and all of his staff and um, Assistant Commissioner Bailey, who's been so supportive, and just all the staff at MDA who have um, put agri dollars towards these grants. Um, I was listening to some of the earlier questions, and they are really good questions, um, and, and thinking about how I will testify today. And I will say it is ironic that um, while I was literally on the way here to testify, our organization was denied funding from this grant. Um, but it's so important. And I think one of the reasons we were denied was because, number one, we've gotten this funding before. It's made a huge impact on our operations. We employ youth, 25 youth every year. We have been able to increase our production tremendously. We grow for our cooking workshops. We grow and distribute in our community, um, in our meal boxes, as well as um, our youth get to sell and have that entrepreneurial experience at the West Broadway Farmers Market. So we have benefited greatly from this funding, and I'm so glad that MDA, I think, has uh, appropriated more than was required by the legislation in this program because it was so popular and has grown over the years. And I will say the initial legislation, we called it cities and towns, exactly for the, the what Senator Gustafson said about this urban-rural divide or this mythical urban-rural divide. But this legislation in the past has allowed for Agri to invest in urban agriculture programs in places like Ely and Rochester and Duluth. And so it's not just a Minneapolis, St. Paul, Hennepin, Ramsey, or seven county metro area bill. This is funding for local food for local people. It's creating jobs, economic development, and it's made a huge impact on our community in North Minneapolis, and I know a number of other communities across the state. So thank you so much for your time. I'm happy to answer questions, but I think you should hear from, I mean, I grow in my backyard, and when we grow at Appetite for Change, I get dirty in the garden, but a real farmer, a real grower, Mr. Page. Mr. Page, if you would please state your full name for the record and commence your testimony when you're ready. Um, Timothy Page, P-A-G-E. Sorry, there you go. Um, I'm a urban farmer. Um, I've grown outside the city before, but I pre prefer being in the city. And a big part of my um, farming is doing education. Um, we, I haven't got the funding, but I've worked with some organization who did, like Broad Town Farm, and on doing education on like um, irrigation. Um, so we worked on the irrigation issue. And then we also put up a high tunnel for a season extension. And we always um, use education, do it, so always work through some youth. And I know that this fund has um, supported that in the past. Um, and it also helps me by, because when I go into the schools to push you not push you toward um, things in agriculture. Um, we're able to talk about, instead of talking about dirt, how do you be a soil scientist? How do you be a plant scientist? And then use that in, um, for agriculture. And it also supports the um, urban-rural divide, for lack of a um, better term because I've always used 4-H and, you know, um, teaching kids how you do things in the city compared to somebody who live on a farm. Um, and I've also used it specifically for um, to speak about the LEAF program where I, I was one of the farmers and I was actually able to take my vegetables to the market and the people who it was going to actually was able to interact with them. So we started, instead of them picking up the stuff, I would deliver it to them and then do classes with them on how to actually use it. So I like that. Um, so for me, the biggest part of the um, agriculture thing is what it does for education and sustainability. 
Thank you, Mr. Page. Members, questions for our testifiers or the bill's author? Senator Kunish. I don't have a question, but I would like to just um, voice my support for this bill. When, um, when my kids were young, they uh, participated in a program called um, Garden Club. It was through uh, the public um, programs in the summer and then at, um, oh, what's the farm over by the, little farm over by the U of M on the St. Paul campus? Do the organic farm? No, it's a historic farm. Anyways, they did this program. And they would get picked up uh, one day a, a week, and they would go to, um, it's going to hit me in a minute, uh, and they would learn about seeds, they would learn about growing, they would learn about pollination, they would learn all about what it is to grow your own food, and then they'd experience that as well. And that's here in what we might call the urban core of the Twin Cities. And that agricultural education has stayed with them you know, all of these years so that as adults now, um, the Kelly Farm, that's what it is, I think it's the Kelly Farm, um, the, uh, it has made a huge difference you know, in, their, in their lives right now when every year they start to grow their own, their own uh, gardens, but then also looking at um, how they can support um, other urban farms in the area. I know this um, a couple of young uh, kids that started a, a program have urban farms and have started to create their own foods to sell kimchi and other things like that. And so, I mean, I look at this as an investment in our youth. I look at this as an investment in our future. And, and when we are looking at um, the health disparities across our state, this is definitely one of those ways that we can address that. So I do just want to voice my support of this bill. Thank you, Senator Kuhner. Senator Dames. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, uh, Senator Gustafson, could you tell me the $1.5 million appropriation requested for 24 and 25, how much of that is going, which, how many dollars are going to the urban youth agricultural education portion, and how much is going for the grants? Senator Gustafson. Mr. Chair, Senator Dames, um, I don't have that specific breakdown. Um, I'm wondering if MDA might. Um, otherwise, I will ask my testifier to elaborate on what she might know to answer your question further. Um, yes. Mr. Um, Chair. Okay. Oh, no, Mr. Chair, if you're okay with that. Certainly, Senator Kuners. Uh, Ms. Uh, Horowitz? Yes, thank you, Mr. Witz. Chair. Me, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chair and um, Senator Dames. I do not work for MDA. I know that they have all the numbers broken down. I believe in the past fiscal year, 2022 to 23, no, I'm sorry, um, 21 to 22, the last completed fiscal year, there was over $500,000 invested in this grant program, and they are all grants. Some of the grants go to support youth education and youth um, employment programs around agriculture, but I don't, I, I don't want to speak off off turn here, I may be incorrect, but I don't believe that all of that funding is going to support youth education. Many of it is going to su support startup farms and early farm entrepreneurs who might not be producing at the capacity that they're ready for, like, let's say the LEAF program, which you just heard about. So these are startup grants anywhere from, I believe, it's no more than 50,000, and I think they range as low as 10. Um, I can tell you how we've spent our grants on increasing our production capacity. Some of our funds has gone to youth employment, but a great deal of it has gone to infrastructure and equipment. Thank you, Ms. Horvitz. We actually do have uh, Ms. Bress from uh, MDA here to help us out with this stuff. Oh. If you wouldn't mind, please state your full name for the record and uh, help us out a little bit, would you? Yeah, yeah. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, for the record, my name is Ashley Bress. I work as the Assistant Director of Egg Marketing and Development. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Dames, um, if I understand you were asking um, of, of that $1.5 million that this bill would appropriate, how much of that would be used for urban agriculture versus grants? Um, well, no, excuse me, ma'am. The question was how many dollars will be used for agricultural education and how many dollars will you be used for the urban Senator grants? Senator Dames has a, a, a clarifying question. Uh, Ms. Bress? 
Excellent, thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Dames, um, that, that $1.5 million would be used for grants for urban ag agriculture, education, and community de 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 development. It is the ur urban ag that would be accomplished through those grants. So the entire $1.5 million minus a little bit of ad ad administrative costs would be used for the grants. Mr. Chair, follow up. Senator Dames. So none of this money will be used for education, for agricultural education. Uh, Ms. Bess? Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Dames, no, that entire $1.5 million would be used for ag education through the provision of grants. So follow Senator up, Mr. Dames. Chair. So Senator Gustafson, can you tell me when the rules were changed with the Agri-Fund to start allowing that to be used for agricultural education. Perhaps Ms. Bress has a greater historical context on that issue. Sure. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Dames, um, the, the Agri Rider beginning in, for fiscal year 2018 ear, ear, earmarked a specific amount for this grant program. Senator Dames. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So in 2018 is when the language was changed to use Agri dollars for ag education, is that what I'm hearing? Ms. Bress? Yeah. It Mr. previously wasn't, I guess. Ms. Bress, point, so actually, well. Ms. Bress, would you like to answer that question, actually? Yes. Uh, Ms. Mr. Chair, Senator Dames, yes. Uh, the, the Agri Rider was was modified in, in for fiscal year 2018 for the department to use up to $250,000 for grants for ur urban agriculture and urban ag community de 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 development. Senator Ames, now if you'd like to continue. Thank you very much for the clarification. I do appreciate it. That's all I have, Mr. Chair. Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, um, similar related. Uh, so when you say all of the money goes to ag education, are we not using any of it to uh, actually make sure there's opportunities for uh, those in urban areas to actually grow the products or what what are we what are we funding with just education, Ms. Bess? Would you like to talk about that, or perhaps Ms. Horowitz can give us a, a concrete example as well? Sure, um, Ms. Bess. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Westrom, um, the 1.5 million dollars, uh, or, or whatever amount is available, that is used for urban ag youth ed ed education as well as urban ag community de development. So these are not necessarily grants that are directly to producers to be again or upgrade their farms. These are grants to pre uh, primarily nonprofit organizations that are serving these communities or these uh, these nonprofit organizations, these the, these areas, so they can engage in youth education or community development. Senator Wester, Mr. Chair, um, and the. Uh, so we're the, the attempt for 1.5 million is is going up from the 250 thousand dollars that's currently permissive and under law. Is that the big change here, Ms. Bess? Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Westrom, uh, the 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 current writer for fiscal year uh, 2022 and 2023 allows for up to 600 thousand dollars per year. Mr. Chair. Uh, this, this, this would allow it up to 1.5 million. Yeah, uh, Ms. Bess. Uh, Ms. Mr. Chair, Senator Westrom, that is correct. And uh, one last question, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Westrom. S Senator Gustafson, um, or maybe to the testifier. When, when this program was uh, introduced to us, uh, my understanding was there was they were going to have uh, help farmers get started in urban centers using pieces of land. In some cases, we had language to even encourage uh, MnDOT and other agencies to uh, proactively find state land that was owned on being unused, uh, maybe highway right-of-ways uh, or big uh, excess right-of-way uh, parcels. Have they done any of that to uh, make sure that there's actual opportunities and things getting grown and maybe you could just talk to us about that and then what 
what are the what are the tangible outcomes that that we're seeing? Uh, what what is being grown? What uh, what what is happening with the urban agriculture and how does it not blend with what we just heard in the last bill? Yeah, thank you, Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, um, there are some tangible uh, impacts of this, so it's a really good question. I am going to have the testifier share some of those experiences, although I don't know specifically about um, the land use. Um, we might have to have both testifiers speak to the, testifiers speak to that. But as far as what this will do and how it will benefit local people, I'm happy to pass that off to my testifier with your permission, Mr. Chair. Certainly, Senator Gustafson. Uh, Ms. Horvitz? Sure, and I, I again, I'm looking to the um, Ms. Brass um, to answer the question about the land use because, of, of course, that is a huge piece of it. And um, my understanding is that you don't have to be a nonprofit to apply for this funding. Is that, yeah? So I, that that's my understanding, and and I believe some of the farmers have been asking for funds for land and for getting started. To I think. Um, Senator Dames's question earlier and to your question, Senator Westrom, an a concrete example will help. Um, in the past, Appetite for Change has received, I, I, again, I think I mentioned we didn't get the grant this round, but in the past, we've gotten the funding to support our, um, our urban agriculture, farmers market, and youth programming. So what that means is that we have 25 young people who are on our payroll. They are part of a year-round youth education program where they are learning how to grow food, how to harvest, how to sell. They are leading cooking workshops. They are um, doing policy and advocacy work and, and working with their peers in the community. So this funding in the past has specifically allowed us to increase our food production capacity. Uh, at Appetite for Change, we grow um, over 10,000 pounds of produce a year. This is... Um, quote unquote specialty crops, but what we like to call real food, tomatoes, zucchini, cucumbers, all the things, greens, and we're using those, um, like I mentioned, in our cooking workshops, distributing them to community for um, who need access. We use them in our meal box program, so it's recipes with ingredients that go um, to the home. Um, and then we also, our youth, again, get the opportunity of selling it at the West Broadway Farmer's Market. Um, in North Minneapolis. So um, these grants have covered youth wages, so in increasing our capacity to provide jobs to young people in the community. It's provided capacity and infrastructure for our farming and production. Um, and I know other nonprofits have used the funds similarly, um, Hmong American Farmers Association, Duluth Food Community Action, um, I, I used to know this uh, list by heart, but there are a lot of different organizations. Tamales y Bicicletas, I believe, on, on the south side. Um, Urban Roots in St. Paul. So a number of, of really wonderful investments over the years. And it did start out at 250000 and then the next language was 350000 But I believe MDA asked for the increase to six hundred on their own because of the demand um, statewide for this grant program. Mr. Chair, I would just, um, if it's okay to speak for a moment, uh, this was, the only change in this is the appropriations. This was all a bill that was in place before um, under past leadership. So again, the, the one change is just the appropriation and that is due to demand. And I'll also say that yes, like small plots of land can be used to produce volumes of diversified crops. Um, one acre can produce enough food to feed 25 to 30 families. Um, and again, this is locally grown food for local communities. So it really is an important program um, that has a tangible and real impact on our communities, especially in urban areas. Thank you, Senator Gustafson. Members, any final questions or comments? Senator Dames. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And Senator Gustafson, can you tell me, uh, I'm not sure who the organization is that's requesting these funds. I know their appropriation goes to the commissioner. But can you tell me, has there been an application put into LCCMR for funding for this, for grants? Mr. Chair, Senator Dames, this comes through AGRI, um, uh, if that helps answer your question. Um, and if it's okay with uh, Chair Putnam, we do have somebody who can answer Ms. Senator Westrom's question about the land use, if that's okay with you, Mr. Chair. Certainly, Mr. Hugan. Mr. From Chair, MDA, I have a follow-up. Uh, um, certainly. All right. Senator, Senator Westrom. Uh, uh, I understand it's coming from Agri. I'll, I'll repeat my question. 
can you tell me, has there been an application made to LCCMR for granting for this project that would be eligible? So that's why I'm asking if you know if whoever asked you to carry the bill or if you've put the bill together, whoever have they applied for an application to LCCMR? That's my question. Senator Gustafson, is that? Mr. Chair, I have, I don't know, but I can find that information for you and get it to you as soon as possible. Thank you. So Mr. Huguenin is here from MDA. If you would please state your full name for the record and offer us any wisdom you can. Good afternoon, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. For the record, my name is Paul Huguenin. I'm the Director of the Ag Marketing and Development Division at the Department of Agriculture. Um, Senator Westrom, to, to go back to your question about public lands, um, the what you had mentioned was the department consulted with other agencies to look at the opportunities for public lands, publicly owned, state owned lands, and whether those could be suitable, suitable for urban agriculture. Um, and so we had consulted with those folks. There's some summary data that I can get you to, uh, to speak directly to your question about that. Um, this grant program kind of built on that and takes that and takes that further in that what these grants do is both education as well as community development. So it's yes, it's working with individual farmers, but it's doing so through nonprofit organizations. So if we're, um, if we're granting to a farmer, it's because the farmer is doing specific community activities and specific community educational activities. Thank you, Mr. Huguen. Members, any final, very brief, very brief comments or questions? Senator Western. Mr. Chair, Mr. Huguen, uh, did that uh, report ever result in the state connecting and uh, facilitating uh, acres of, of unused land for anybody engaging in urban agriculture? Mr. Huguen. Uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Westrom, I'm not aware of any specific um, tangible examples where farmers have leased land specifically coming out of that project. I can tell you though, one of the things that we've done is, um, you may be familiar with our FarmLink program, which is a way for farmers to say that they have land available or looking for somebody to take over that land. But FarmLink is also a vehicle where a, a state agency or a city or any other public entity could say, we have land that's available for lease for local farmers. And so that's how we would um, let farmers know that there's land available for leasing. I'm not aware that at this moment that we have any public lands that are listed in that, but that's, that's how we would approach that. And we've, we've reached out to folks to let them know that's available. Thank you, Mr. Egan. Members, any final questions? Senator Gustafson, your closing comments. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I would just say that in every other committee I sit on, I advocate for more opportunities in greater Minnesota. And here I sit before you um, advocating for more opportunities in rural or in urban Minnesota. This is one of those opportunities where we can share our love of agriculture. We can create new farmers. We can teach um, newer gen or younger generations about the joys and the successes of farming. And this is a really opportunity to expand that. So I uh, urge your support and I thank you for your time. Thank you, Senator Jefferson. Senate file 2016 will be laid over for possible inclusion. Members, just a, a quick uh, point. We are coming up on, upon a, a time crunch of sorts. So uh, I'm gonna ask our remaining testifiers to try to expedite their testimony and perhaps do so within two to three minutes, your testifying time, if you can, please. And members, I'm gonna ask us to focus our lines of inquiry on issues most germane to the viability of the bill directly in front of us and to be as efficient as we possibly can. Our next bill that we already discussed is Senate File 2158, Farm to School Program. Senator Gufsis, and I understand you have an author's amendment. I do, thank you, Mr. Chair. I believe that you have that at your committee, but I would like to um, ask that it be accepted so we can get the bill in the order needed to move forward. Members, any questions or comments about the author's amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Uh, author's amendment uh, is amended, the bill is amended. Senator Gustafson, to your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, before you is the Senate file 2158. This bill continues my theme today of leveraging state dollars to improve our local food systems and grow economic opportunities for Minnesota farmers. It also aligns with another focus area of mine, school lunches and feeding our students. 
So farm to school programs are not new in Minnesota where they have been implemented. They have proven to be immensely popular among districts, farmers, and students. There are new programs out there though that address so many problems while being um, equal, equally loved by metro, suburban, and rural Minnesota. However, like the other bills I brought before you today, these programs need investment and in state to reach their full potential. Uh, the $300,000 in grants that MDA provided for farm to school in 21 and 22 generated an estimate $1.2 million in an economic impact, but MDA received more than $4.5 million worth of requests. By not having enough funding available for these grants, Minnesota farmers missed out on millions of dollars of positive economic impact that they desperately need. 2158 fixes that problem. It provides $5.6 million in 24 and 25 to MDA to develop and enhance farm to school and farm to early care programs. This is a significant investment, but it is well defined within the bill and represents a minimum need. The bulk of the money is reserved to reimburse schools for purchase of agriculture products, but 2158 also dedicates money for an ex um, external evaluation of the program um, community-based regional coordinators to provide marketing assistance to farmers and funds for schools to upgrade their lunchroom equipment. Crucially, 21, Senate File 2158 dedicates a portion of its funds to a fund a full-time statewide coordinator for farm to school strategy at MDA to help keep these programs on track and successful. I sought out a seat in this committee because I recognize the tremendous problems facing our farmers and problems for all Minnesota. I want to help find smart solutions that benefit us all. 2158 is exactly that kind of bill. Any bill that has superintendents and teachers, farmers, hipsters, students, parents, inner city Minneapolis, far north Minnesota telling you to pass it should be a pretty easy bill to get behind. I urge you to support Senate file 2158 and I'll turn it over to my testifiers when you're ready, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Gustafson. My understanding is our first two testifiers online. Mr. Doherty, if you are available, please, would you turn on your camera, unmute your microphone, state your full name for the record, and commence your testimony when you're ready. Hello, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we're good. For the record, my name is Ben Doherty. I live in farm near Northfield. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee for listening and having us here today. Uh, I'll try to speed this along. Um, since 2006, my wife Erin and I have owned and operated Open Hands Farm, a 15-acre vegetable farm outside of Northfield. We've been LSP members for 18 years. We grow most vegetables that can be grown here with an emphasis on carrots, beets, and other roots for fall and winter. We're selling carrots right now uh, to school districts uh, and uh, several other customers. We'll probably sell the last pallet of carrots from last fall's harvest in May this coming year. At our farm, we employ five people full-time for nine months of the year. Four of them work part-time through the winter, washing and packing carrots and other storage crops. We believe investments in farmers and children are among the most simple and intelligent investments we can make. And we encourage you to support Senate File 2158 as a straightforward and simple win-win for, for our whole state. As you probably know, um, fruit and vegetable producers of any size don't receive any direct price or market subsidies. As with most crops, the produce industry for fruits and vegetables nationally and globally is fiercely competitive. Every day, our prices for a modest living are compared to the rock bottom prices set by the largest growers, mostly from desert parts of North America. In that competitive industry, none of the programs for fruit and vegetable producers involve direct subsidy for price or for profitability. But like farmers of all crops, we're eligible for a lot of USDA and MDA programs, and those programs have a big impact. Over the years on our farm, we've benefited from several of them, from low interest loans with FSA for land and for buildings, to value added grants, to build our coolers for ideal winter storage, to equip funds from NRCS to help reduce soil erosion, and to improve our irrigation system. All those programs have made a huge difference in our small business growing into a more stable and profitable operation. I see this increase in farm to school funding as a very similar opportunity to help many more farms in Minnesota be strong and thriving while helping more kids learn to love Minnesota foods. 
I know you have high hopes for the future of Minnesota agriculture, that farmers of all sizes and farmers of all crops can continue to thrive and grow and be the bedrock of all of our communities. Supporting schools and using Minnesota grown foods is one of many critical parts of that hopeful future. It's an easy win-win for all of us. And this is a unique moment in time where many districts have been trying but really struggling to make more substantial and lasting change to what we feed our kids and where we buy it from. Regarding the importance of the farm to school coordinator, local food coordinator positions that this bill would also create. Changing, as you probably know too, changing school lunch and snack programs to be able to handle raw ingredients and direct from the farm products is a complicated task for any size school district. School nutrition directors are asked to feed our kids well with small staffs and very tight budgets. They need more support and funding to do that job well that society wants them to do. For eight years now, we uh, from our farm have sold vegetables to Minneapolis public schools, averaging over $40,000 a year in sales for our small, far small farm business. They have an outstanding farm to school program in that district, which is very highly regarded around the country. One of the keys to their success is having a farm to school coordinator on staff. It doesn't make sense for smaller districts to have that position and maybe even for some bigger districts to have a dedicated person in that role. One aspect of this bill is to create positions for local food coordinators in regions around the state. These coordinators will help meet the challenges of improving school lunch into something that more kids will want to eat and that'll help them grow and learn even better. And that will also help more farmers connect with this emerging wholesale market. Over the years, we've tried to develop relationships with at least four other smaller school districts in our area who want to increase the amount of local food in their meals. Usually they contact me, reach out to me looking for carrots or a few other crops. Um, some of those have had passionate nutrition directors willing to dedicate extra time and energy. Some have had help from nonprofits or extension agents. Only one of those districts has been able to substantially increase their amount of local foods purchasing in a lasting way. I know there are many districts trying and ready to serve more Minnesota foods, but running into problems of labor, menuing, and food costs. As a farmer, I would love for them to all have a coordinator supporting them and making it more feasible for them to use more local farm products. Investing in their success with both the purchasing for funds in this bill and the coordinator positions will make a huge difference in their success rate. So I encourage you to support this bill, the Farm to School Bill for our farmers, for our kids, and for our futures. Thank you, all of you, for your hard work. Thank you, Mr. Doherty. Ms. Haig, if you would please turn on your camera, uh, unmute your microphone, and uh, state your full name for the record and commence your testimony when you're ready. Mr. Chair and members, good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Amy Haig. Can you guys all hear me? Yeah, you're good. Okay. My name is Amy Haig, and I am the Farm to School Coordinator, or liaison, for the Hutchinson, Litchfield, and Dasico Cato School Districts. Uh, we have a unique cooperative model in food services, um, but we are three separate districts. I live on our farm in Litchfield, where my partner and I ran a vegetable farm until 2019. Um, and have been a longtime member of the Land Stewardship Project. I believe in the power of community-based food systems. And tonight I will be testifying in support of Senate File 2158. The districts that I represent are three-time recipients of the Agri Farm to School Full Tray Reimbursement Grants. These funds have, been, have inspired our kitchens to adopt a more seasonal menu and bring in freshly harvested nutrient-dense foods to the cafeteria. Um, Student excitement is growing as they're exposed to new ingredients, these community stories of our farmers and, and better tasting foods. This excitement means increased participation rates and therefore increased access to nutrition for all. Because of these awards, our schools are on track to, to spend $630,000 worth of local food in just three quick years. Our farm to school program feeds over 6,300 students, inspires 12 kitchens, and purchases fresh fruits and vegetables, beef, dairy, dry beans, honey, and maple syrup from over a dozen farmers and ranchers in three counties. As a former farmer, I can confidently say that this significantly impacts the bottom line of each and every one of our farming partners. Our districts have also been awarded equipment grants uh, from these farm to school uh, dollars. We have purchased industrial food processors, better oven technology, new coolers and freezers, and our success in the cafeterias is without a doubt because of these improvements. This equipment gives our food service staff the tools they need to do the high quality ingredients justice. 
Dollars to improve the kitchen infrastructure and support our local purchases are necessary pieces to establishing a successful farm to school program. However, I'm especially here today to speak to the importance of creating regional local food coordinator positions across our state. It's a big, quiet, like open void right now if you're a farmer or in the kitchens. Uh, we have been successful um, in our three districts because my director has carved out space within her budget um, for the coordinating role that I have. In talking to other districts who have reached out to me for help, and there are several, um, this is not a commonly supported option. Having a focus coordinator has helped our districts take our farm to school program from zero to 60 in three years. With funding, my position could and should be replicated across the state of Minnesota. Coordinators like me can build relational capital that will revolutionize the local food system here in Minnesota. Folks in this role can be educated about food safety concerns and best practices for both kitchens and farmers, replicate successes among classrooms, kitchens and farms to make meaningful change quickly, share stories of specific crop varieties with staff so they can buy in and be great ambassadors for the students, consult with a nutrition director um, of the district to design seasonal menus that reflect the specific abundance of farmers in the area, plug into statewide farm to school harvest of the month and hopefully MDA networks, for support, strengthen community conversations about food access, and importantly, be the point person to help BIPOC emerging and otherwise marginalized farmers access scalable markets. This kind of people power, with this kind of people power, farmers and ranchers will be able to sell tons and tons of food back into their communities, providing better nutrition to our school age kids. Last year, we saw a federal grant of four and a quarter million dollars, and still these funds were not su sufficient for our demand. We can choose to notice this momentum and help create a lasting community-based food system that works for farmers, for small businesses, and for institutions. We can choose to make space for farmers' stories in our schools, and we can choose to invest in community feeding community. Let's do that. Thank you for engaging in this work and allowing me to testify. Thank you very much, Ms. Haig. Our next testifier is Ms. McKee. Ms. McKee, if you would please state your full name for the record and commence your testimony when you're ready. Thank you, Chair Putnam and members of the committee. My name is Erin McKee. I'm the Community Food Systems Program Director at the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy, which is a nonprofit. We're based in Minneapolis. And maybe I fall into like the hipster category of supporter of this bill. Um, thank you for letting me share today on why I'm urging your support for Senator Gustafson's Farm to School and Early Care Bill, Senate File 2158, and its inclusion in the final Agriculture Omnibus Bill. So a little bit of background about me. I am a member of the Minnesota Farm to School Leadership Team and the Minnesota Farm to Early Care Advisory Network, uh, Network Advisory Group. I've worked on supporting farm to school and early care programs in Minnesota for 13 years. I've collaborated with schools, Head Starts, and Early Cares all over the state to implement local purchasing, created supportive resources, and conducted evaluation activities to bolster the growth of these initiatives statewide, including evaluation of MDA's Farm to School Grant Program. And you also have um, some of the materials we created with that work in your reference materials as well. Um, an interesting thing, I, I worked with the coordination of a broad group of stakeholders who developed the, the asks for the initial farm to school bill that ended up establishing the grant program and the components of that are included in Senator Gustafson's bill today. So that group began conversations about what was needed in Minnesota in 2014 based on the barriers that we were seeing as we tried to do these programs in communities. And we supported several rounds of advocacy. We saw our bill passed in 2019, and we've been thrilled at the success of the program so far. But one thing that I've noticed is that the asks that are included in this bill today are the same things that our stakeholders identified in our very first conversations almost a decade ago. We knew what we needed then, and we have the experience to support the requests for you now. We believe that the plan outlined in this bill has the potential to be transformational in harnessing the po positive momentum that we see in Minnesota, and it really can take farm to school and early care programs to the next level for our state. So first of all, to it's really critical to increase the funding for the MDA farm to school and early care grant program, um, which reimburses schools for purchases made from local farmers, and it also has a component for equipment purchases so that schools can do more scratch cooking. 
Last year, um, MDA received a $3.5 million federal infusion of funding to, to Minnesota to support that grant program. So they had 4.25 to offer, including the state funding, and they still had more demand than the funding that was available. Uh, we really think that this is a critical time to make the investment to increase this funding um, to five million per year as it will leverage the momentum created by that federal investment and really signal to farmers, schools, and early cares that they can plan around sustainable local purchasing. This level of funding um, is really a meaningful investment that will have the power to shift purchasing patterns and farmer business plans. And we see that other states have already been supporting farm to school at higher levels than what we've seen in Minnesota. So for example, Oregon funded a similar program at $10.4 million in 2019, and Michigan funded a similar program at $9.3 million in 2023, just for your reference about what's happening in other states. Um, we're very thrilled that early care providers are being ad added as eligible applicants to the MDA grant program, as was the original intent um, from stakeholders. So at IATP, we actually implemented a farm to early care mini grant program um, in the last two years. And in our first round in 2021, 15% of applications were funded, so 14 out of 94 applications. In 2022, we actually had 369 applications and we were able to fund 7% um, of the applications uh, for mini grants of $250. We had centers who were applied and we could fund 9% of those applications. So this is a huge untapped market for our local farmers and there's a lot of interest. We really believe that our littlest eaters who depend on early care meals for a huge percentage of their nutritional intake um, deserve this local food and it's a window, window of opportunity to influence their taste preferences and their eating habits that can carry forward for the rest of their lives. Um, we also believe this is a huge win for our farmers, our students and communities and especially for our rural communities because it keeps dollars circulating in their local economies. So in our evaluation report, um, you can see that for every dollar spent by schools through this grant, it generated an additional dollar of impact in local economic activity. Um, we also saw that once those buying relationships were established, the schools actually went above and beyond what was required. Um, and just incidentally, we saw that there was an additional 28,000, over $28,000 in additional local purchases that we just happened to see um, in the submissions for, for reimbursement. So we're sure that there's even more that wasn't submitted, but it, once those relationships are established, that's really the hurdle that they need to get over and it can establish things that will carry forward. Um, so we also do really appreciate that there's planning for a continued evaluation activity in this grant, or in this bill as well. Um, and then I think that our, our other testifiers have spoken very well to the need for the regional geographically based coordinators to support scaling up and purchasing from local um, farmers. And we've consistently heard about the need for that from partners. But I won't speak to that because I know we're short on time. I'll just say that the Farm to School and Early Care Bill is a worthy investment. It supports the health of our children, the livelihoods of our family farms, and connections in our local communities. So I would please ask you to support this bill, SF2158. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McKee. Members, questions or comments? Senator Western. Mr. Chair, um, how much of this money goes to first-time uh, connections and farm farmers versus how much of it's repeat uh, to the same farm that's already connected to the food? To Ms. The McKee, you look uh, like you're enthusiastic about offering an answer. <laughs> Thank you, Chair Putnam and Senator Westrom. That's such a good question. I, I was thinking you might be asking, because they do have two levels of the bill. Um, they have a first bite grant that is supporting schools that are new to um, local purchasing. So I know that in the most recent round of the grant in, for fiscal year 2023, um, they were going to have 60 first bite grants and then 56 full tray, which is the term um, for schools that are maybe more experienced and are purchasing a little bit more. However, um, we haven't yet documented exactly which farmers are new, and I think that's a really good question that we could include in the evaluation planning for going forward. Senator Western, we good? Hey folks, uh, seeing no further uh, questions, uh, Senator Gustafson, your closing comments. 
Um, thank you, Mr. Chair um, and, and members. And I just have to say, those are adorable ways of categorizing things. That is so cute. Uh, <laughs> first bite, full tray, yes. love it. Um, I just want to say thank you uh, for letting me go through these bills today. It's really about growing food for our local communities and benefiting the most amount of people that we can through the love of agriculture and building our agriculture community. So thank you so much. Thank you, Senator Gustafson. Senate File 2158, as amended, will be laid out for possible inclusion. Um, members, we still have two more bills to go. Uh, Senate File 39, Senator Kunish, Pollinator Research Funding Establishment. Uh, if you please uh, take the position. Um, your testifiers, Dr. Caravo and Dr. Spivak, if you would please come up to the table. Take your positions. And Senator Kunish, when you're ready to the bill, please. Uh, we're doing 39 first? Yes. Okay. Great. Uh, so before us, we have uh, Senate File 39, but I do have uh, an amendment. The A1 amendment simply updates the date from 2025 to 2030 and then um, inserts the appropriation to it. And so I would move the A1 amendment. Senator Kunish moves the A1 amendment. Members, any discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? The amendment is adopted. Senator Kunish to Senate File 39 as amended, please. Great, thank you. So this bill will amend, uh, it will modify, extend, and provide additional funding to the pollinator research account that was established in the 2017 legislative session, and then it was modified uh, just last year in 2022. Under the current law, this bill, with uh, and the money in the account is appropriated to the University of Minnesota for pollinator research and outreach and will extend the account to 2020, excuse me, 2030. Uh, also transferring additional money from the general account, general fund to the account and specify an additional eligible use such as research and outreach concerning how pesticides, parasites and climate disruption impacts pollinators. And that's my bill. Thank you, Senator Kunish. Your first testifier, actually testifiers, again, a quick reminder, if we could go two to three minutes of brilliance, that'd be really, really helpful. Uh, Dr. Carabo, if you would, please. Do you want me, can I start? Yep, or go ahead. Dr. Spivak, would you prefer to go first? <laughs> if you would, please state your full name for the record and commence Thank your testimony. Thank you, Chairman and Committee. My name is Dr. Marla Spivak, and I'm a professor at the University of Minnesota in the Department of Entomology. And um, I'm just here to, we have some slides. I don't know if they're up, but it doesn't matter. Um, in 2016, we opened the Bee Research Laboratory on the St. Paul campus um, with funding from the state of Minnesota, and that allowed us to expand our capacity and productivity and promote change and new research. Our mission is to promote the conservation, health, and diversity of pollinators through research, education, and hands-on mentoring, and we work as a team to provide the richest learning environment for students at all levels and from all backgrounds. So inside the Bee Lab, we have two professors, myself and Dr. Dan Caravo, who will talk in just a brief second. And um, uh, we both do research. We're, there ha we have two extension educators, Dr. Elaine Evans and Dr. Katie Lee, who does extension on honeybees. Dr. Evans does re extension work on native and wild bees. Uh, within the honeybee lab, we have we, uh, work with tech transfer teams. It's a national group, part of a national group to help monitor the health and productivity of our commercial honeybee colonies throughout the state. And then we both teach courses. Um, so I'm going to if it's okay, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Ken, Dan Caravo. Ken Darabo. <laughs> Dr. Caravo, if you'll please state your full name for the record and commence your testimony when you're ready. Uh, my name is uh, Dan Caravo. I'm a faculty member at the department, in the Department of Entomology at the University of Minnesota. I want to thank everyone uh, thank for the support of the bill and being here. Um, so just want to highlight some of the work that we've done with some of the funding that in the past. So um, in particular, there was a project we call, we always have to have an acronym, called the Minnesota Agriculture for Pollinators Project. So this funding was used to launch a large study working with private landowners in southwest 
uh, Minnesota to look at how habitat and putting in habitat on working farms influenced uh, native bees, which is the group of bees that I study, as well as honeybees, which is the group that my colleague Dr. Spivak studies. We also looked at um, how that habitat might influence what we call the good bugs. Those are the things that eat the nasty things like soybean aphids and other things. And then we also looked at uh, pesticides and some of the economics. So that's what we've used this money to do in the past. And what was really great about this is we were able to leverage that funding to, uh, I was able to leverage the funding to acquire another million dollars from the United States Department of Agriculture through, so using that money to get some federal funds to conduct this, this work. So it's been really appreciated. Um, and just wanna highlight some of the really neat stuff too. We, we've actually, so I study native bees as I mentioned. There are 20,000 native bees um, uh, globally, and we've done the first kind of really big comprehensive work along with the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources, and we've now documented, we're just coming out with this paper, it just got accepted in peer review, about 507 or eight species of bees that are native to the state of Minnesota. So we have that documented, and we're super excited by that, and that'll be out soon. And so we've been working on that for quite some time. So. A lot of work that's been going on through the use of, of these funds in the past. Uh, yeah, please uh, state your name for the record, if you would, please. Hello, and my name is here. Elaine Evans. I am an extension educator and researcher at the University of Minnesota, working at the Bee Lab alongside Dr. Spivak and Caravo. And um, I wanted to, to speak with you about um, some of the, the outreach um, work that we do. Arrow was not working for me. <laughs> um, so in addition to, to research, we do a lot of work reaching out across the state to, um, to, to reach over 100,000 individuals with some of these pollinator education outreach toolkits that we've created. We also do a lot with public engagement. So we have a lot of public participants who are helping us monitor bees. So in addition to, to just knowing what bees we have, we're getting information about where they are, which is really important for species like the rusty patch bumblebee, which is a federally protected bee. There's a lot of things that, um, that we need to know about, about where they are so that we can best protect protect them. So, um, so the, the outreach works hand in hand with the research that we do within the Bee Lab. And um, through both the, the research and the outreach, we're able to um, you know, expand what we're doing uh, with, with your support, help Minnesotans, help pollinators, and, um, and gain new insights and reach new audiences to move towards a more pollina pollinator-friendly future in Minnesota. Thank you. Members, do you have any questions or comments? Sir Dames. Sir Dames. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Dr. Spivak, would you come forward, please? Well, good to see you again, and thank you for being here. We certainly appreciate it. Just a couple of questions for you. I know when I served in LCCMR, you applied for several grants and were very fortunate to get several grants. Could you tell me, uh, have you applied for grants through LCCMR in the last couple of years? Dr. Spivak. Thank you, Chair and Senator Dams. Uh, in the, the last grant that I received from uh, INTREF and LCCMR was for the BLON project, and I have not applied for funding since that. How about legacy? Senator Dames. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Sorry about that. How about legacy? Dr. Uh, Spivak. Senator, no, I have not. Senator uh, Dames. Mr. Chair. Senator Dames. Follow up. Well, uh, thank you for the information, uh, Dr. Spivak. I guess one of my concerns is, is that we have both LCCMR and we have legacy that your request, your pollinator research fits right into that program. So I'm a little concerned that we're coming to the general fund asking for dollars when we have approximately 60 million in LCCMR on an annual basis. I don't know what legacy is. I know it's considerably more. And so I think that uh, we should be using those funds for these types of things versus money out of the general fund. I do appreciate the work you do. I know you folks do great work. And uh, always appreciated what you did when I was on LCCMR. But I, I do have a, a concern here that we're starting to expand now. 
And the University of Minnesota gets a lot of dollars from, from the general fund and from, from the state. And so I'm starting to get concerned that we're going to start expanding how we fund the university through bits and pieces coming in and requesting dollars. And so that's just my concern. Uh, thank you for responding. Thank you. Uh, members, oh, Dr. Spivak? If I may, very Certainly. briefly, um, thank you. I appreciate your concern. I should have said also that Dr. Caravo has got, had, had several rounds of LCCMR funding as well as uh, Elaine Evans through other groups. Um, I do appreciate your concern and maybe you can speak to that, why it would be necessary. Um, I don't know. Senator Kunish. Pardon me. So I, I'm not sure why this was sent to the Ag Committee. Um, but it is sort of reassuring to know that we have a number of uh, pots of uh, resources and funding to address some of these issues. And um, I have heard you, you know, say this uh, a couple times this, this, uh, this committee hearing. And so in the future, um, when folks come to me or when it's suggested that the funding come through AG, we now know that there are um, possible other alternatives for funding. So thank you. Members, any further questions or comments? Senator Dornick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was just going to, Senator Kunish, the uh, new funding for pesticide, parasite, and climate disruption impacts. That's uh, underlined, so I'm just wondering if you could explain, uh, or one of your testifiers, kind of the research there and what, uh, um, yeah, it's new, correct? Or I guess the first question is. Senator Kunish. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator. I don't believe it's new. That's not new language in this. Oh, I guess it is. Excuse me. I'm sorry. I was thinking of a different one. Um, so in the past for polliner, uh, pollinator research and outreach, and, and I'll ask one of these uh, folks to respond, um, not limited to just pesticides or studying about how parasites are going to affect um, uh, the agriculture and the pollination, and then, of course, climate is disrupting our um, pollinators in a lot of different ways. So I think it's basically expanding the ability to use these funds to look at other, um, other ways that our pollinators are being affected. Dr. Carvo or Dr. Spivak, would you have anything to add to that? Dr. Spivak? Thank you, Chairman and committee, um, the ability of having additional funding beyond the LCCMR and legacy funds would be to have more long-term research projects like the MAP project that Dr. Caravo was running and other programs, um, outreach and education programs, and also the monitoring and help for our commercial beekeepers in this state, their commercial honey beekeepers who are still having a very rough time keeping colonies alive. So that kind of not only can we do the research, but the extension and the outreach and the hands-on mentoring with all kinds of constituents and uh, beekeepers and groups of people. And we can help them monitor pesticide residues and other effects through longer-term funding, which would be very helpful. Thank you. Senator Dornick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just to follow up, so is there any data that you've uh, so it's re researched before, or is, I'm sure it has, is there any data on past data uh, on the results of the effects of these? Or uh, I guess I would think you'd be just building off that. So is there any existing data? I'm Dr. Spivak, I think we're talking about the, the pesticides component of the program itself. Yeah, and Senator Dornack's looking for a kind of history of past successes in research. Is that a fair characterization of your question? History of past, excuse me. Uh, past successes in some of your research labors related to pesticides specifically. Well, pesticides, uh, parasites, and climate disruptions. Yeah. Thank you, Chairman Dr. and Committee. Dr. I'll begin, and then I'll let uh, Dr. Caravo add on. So we, I had two graduate students that do, did a lot of research on the effects of pesticides on honeybee queens and on bumblebee queens and the effects of pesticides, and Elaine Evans did some research on this also, um, the, the finding of pesticide residue in agricultural areas. Um, in most cases, it's the sublethal exposure to pesticides. That would include some exposure to 
neonics, the um, insecticides, but also drift from other insecticides, sometimes leading to acute, but most often sublethal effects. We're learning from other researchers, not our own, that there are effects of glyphosate on uh, the microbiome of bees, which is Roundup, uh, an herbicide. And there are effects of some fungicides also on the microbiome and also um, not only not all fungicides, but sometimes in combination with other insecticides. So I think what we know mostly about exposure to pesticides is that it's out there, it's often sublethal, and often combines in ways uh, to the detriment of making bees and other pollinators more susceptible to diseases, uh, viruses, and um, if they're poorly nourished because they don't have enough forage out there, they also become more susceptible to the effects of even sublethal exposure to pesticides. Thank you, Dr. Spick. Dr. Carver, do you have anything you'd like to add? Yeah, well, we've, we're, we've done some work with pesticides on the MAP project, and we're just getting those data in, so I don't have a good summary of them at the moment. But some of the parasite work that we're, we've been doing work with, uh, with viruses, um, we also th think that the rusty patch bumblebee, which is a bee that's declined dramatically in the last while, the best evidence we have, it's not conclusive, but the best evidence is that it was due to a pathogen. And so we think that the path pathogens are really interesting, but very difficult to study in a lot of these bees. And so we're, that's kind of a next step that we're trying to get into is looking at some of the interactions between landscape. We do a lot of habitat work and also how that might be, how that might influence uh, uh, the parasites and viruses and things like that that get into the bees. So, yeah. Senator Dornick. And Ch Senator, uh, excuse uh, me, Mr. Chair. Um, I also, in 2016, participated in a position paper for the League of Women Voters on the effects of neonicotinoids against, on, on our um, pollinators as well. So if you want, I can send you that link. <laughs> Look at you. <laughs> Senator Dornick. Thank you. No, no further questions. Thanks. Members, no further questions or comments? Uh, Senator Kunish, if you would, your closing comments. Um, just that I would hope that we could um, support this, this bill in the way because we do need to continue to do that research and outreach uh, for our pollinators and um, uh, taking into account Senator Dame's um, information about alternative routes to funding these things. Um, we certainly can look into that in the future, if not later on in this session. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Kunish. Uh, Senate file 39, uh, as amended, will be laid over for possible inclusion. Our last order of business today, folks, is Senate file 335, Senator Kunish, University of Minnesota Heritage Oil Seed and Grain Initiative Appropriation. Uh, Dr. Mul Mulbauer, who is here with us today, if you would please come to the desk uh, to expedite things, and Senator Kunish, if you would, uh, present your bill. Great. Uh, I, this is my second bill, Senate File 335, and this bill would appropriate $2.5 million to the Minnesota Department of Agriculture for a one-time grant to the U of M to evaluate, propagate, and maintain the genetic diversity of oil seeds grains, grasses, legumes, and other plants that are in commercial distribution and used in Minnesota um, before 1970. Um, this excludes wild rice. And so this bill specifies that the appropriation should include funding for uh, associated, associated University of Minnesota extension efforts and outreach, especially to small farmers and farmers who are black, indigenous, and, and BIPOC folks and specifies that the U must uh, protect traditional seeds brought to Minnesota by immigrant communities. And that is my bill. Thank you, Senator Kanesh. Uh, Dr. Muehlbauer, if you would please state your full name for the record and commence your testimony when you're ready. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. <clears throat> my name is, um, I'm Professor Gary Muehlbauer, head of the Department of Agronomy and Plant Genetics at the University of Minnesota. Thank you for the opportunity to provide an informational presentation on, the, on Senate File 335. Heritage Oil Seed and Grain Initiative. I appreciate your time today and thank you for inviting me to comment. The intent of the bill, as was stated, is to evaluate, propagate, and maintain the genetic diversity of oil seeds, grains, grasses, legumes, and other plants, including flax, timothy, barley, rye, triticale, alfalfa, orchard grass, clover, and other species and varieties that were in commercial distribution and use in Minnesota prior to 1970, excluding wild rice. 
This appropriation includes funding for associated extension outreach to small and BIPOC farmers. There are two primary components to this bill in, in, our, in, our, in the University of Minnesota's view. One is about propagation, evaluation, and maintenance of seed, and, and the other is about setting up an online database for the public, ac public to access the, the collection and then distribution of the seed. The propagation, maintenance, and distribution of seed is a long-term and per perpetuity um, and expensive endeavor. The key to the success of this project is to improve our seed storage space. Recently, we've been working to assess how we can make space improvements for some rooms for seed storage, and this project offers an opportunity to advance this work. Our current very rough estimate, based on previous evaluation not specific to this project, is that the upgraded storage um, capacity in our crop research and crop services building on the St. Paul campus of the University of Minnesota and including capacity for storage of seeds in Senate File 335 would require significant improvement of space and include cold storage capacity upgrades as well. The total is approximately 1.3 million for completion of this particular project. And so these are rough estimates. Um, we're not sure exactly what they will turn out to be, but this is about what we think it will be. The propagation, evaluation, and database development and maintain maintenance of seed would require technical support as well. Uh, my colleagues and I estimate that it would require two to three years to assemble, evaluate, this is a varietal identification, propagate and database the germplasm necessary to establish a collection, and that during that two to three years, an annual investment of approximately 200,000 per year for a PhD level manager and a technician would be necessary to manage the effort with input from collaborating faculty in these crop areas and other materials and travel for a total of about $600,000 for the three year period. However, however, if there's no support beyond those years, there would be limited ability to, to distribute seed and further develop the scope. Still, once developed, the seed could be stored and distributed as necessary with relatively limited costs. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Milbar. Members, questions, comments? Senator Dames. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, could you tell me, sir, the uh, dollars you were talking about I think it was 1.9 million for storage facilities. Are you actually talking a building, a building, or what? I maybe missed something here, uh, Dr. Milbar. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, um, Senator. I can't see your name, Dames. Um, so we are the storage facility is um, we have current space, um, but the storage facilities were built in the 50s in some cases or were old growth chambers in other cases that we've cleared out and we spent significant amount of money clearing out these current spaces and these are current spaces in crops research and crops um, service on the University of Minnesota campus. Um, and so we, we're requesting upgrades to those spaces by either putting in modular seed storage spaces or renovating the current um, old seed storage space that was, um, that were developed in the 50s and 60s. So these, and, uh, and just uh, as a correction, it's um, about $1.3 million for the seed storage space. Well, thank you. Senator Daines. And Mr. Chair, thank you. Uh, just for the record, again, I don't have a problem with the work that's being done, but when we start looking at the university and our state colleges, when we start renovating buildings and stuff, that usually comes under HEPA request, and I think that that's where this would belong. The balance of the money, I think there's, uh, I just, I don't think that we're going down the right direction when we start taking departments at a time and giving them separate funding from what the University of Minnesota is requesting. This should all be part of the University of Minnesota's request and it should be handled as one request. And so I get very concerned, as I said a little earlier, I get very concerned about picking and choosing different departments and this and that and in a sense, uh, inviting these folks to come in and request money, and I can see where this train is going, and it's going to get down the tracks pretty fast. I just want that on the record. Thank you, sir. I appreciate what you're doing. Appreciate the work on the seed stuff that you do do, but I think there's a different way that we should be looking at funding it. Thank you, Senator Dames. Members, any other questions or comments? Senator Kunich, your closing comments. Appreciate the comments and the education here today and um, would appreciate your support in funding this uh, opportunity. Thank you, Senator Kennedy. Senate file 335 uh, will be laid over for possible inclusion. Members, that's our last uh, bit of business for the day. A real quick preview of where we're going. Uh, first off, uh, I'd like to encourage you all to clear your dance cards on Monday.
uh, this upcoming Monday, not the Wednesday we're talking about, but a week from today, is likely to be a fairly lengthy meeting because we're going to have uh, a lot of other stuff to do. Uh, so please, if I could ask you to have some flexibility that day so that we can be here as long as we can be to, to get the work done that we need to do. Uh, this upcoming Wednesday, our next session, we'll be hearing uh, six bills. Uh, the first is a woman venture appropriation to establish a business expansion program for women food entrepreneurs. The second is a Senator Murphy bill, which is a Center for Rural Policy and Development Grants Appropriation. Then we'll be hearing a bill from Minority Leader Johnson about Minnesota Turf Seed Council grant appropriation. Then Senator Green's Wolf and Elk Depredation Payments Appropriation. Then Senator Kupek's Program Establishment to Provide Grants to Prevent Wolf Livestock Conflict. And last, Senator Kupek's Deer Abatement and Crop Damage Report Appropriation. Uh, there being no further business before the committee, uh, the committee is adjourned. <laughs>